a doodle. It's a doodle. He's pretty sneaky, actually. He gives me, he has a word that he's was having issues with. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives me the part that has that word in it. <laughs> Psalm 16, keep me safe, my Lord, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say to the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not par pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lies have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. Keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with the eternal present, precious, present, treasures at your right hand. So be it. Amen. Thank you. Good? Huh? Fix my shirt? What else? Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, we do come before your throne today. We are so thankful that we are so privileged and so blessed that we can be called children of the Most High. That because of what Jesus Christ has so selflessly done for us, that He gave up heaven, gave up His life for us, and went silently before His accusers, took our shame and our burden upon Him, so that death has no sting for us, so that we can be victorious through Jesus, and so that we can be sealed by the Holy Spirit to be in a new type of relationship with You where we can cry out, Abba, Father. We just thank You and praise You. We ask for You to fill us with Your Spirit today. Lord, as we draw closer to you, Lord, we just pray that you make yourself known, that you fill us with your spirit so that we can be a light to this world. Open our ears and open our eyes to see you, Lord. And we just thank you for all that Jesus has done and the promises that he gave us that he will never forsake us and that he will return and forever be with us. We just thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen. So, I thought we might read some scripture today. Sherry, now you know what these are for. Come here. If you're willing to read a scripture, hold up your hand and she'll bring it to you. There's a few of them. They're not hard. They might have some words like libation in them, but I'm not sure if they do or not. So if you'll read one in a little bit, raise your hand up and she'll bring it to you. Did you get a title for this, Kim? No. Okay, well the title of this sermon is David the Prophet. Because we're going to look further into Acts 2. And have you ever thought about David as a prophet? Because that's exactly what Peter calls him. You know, you think about David as the king. You think about David as a shepherd. You think about um, David as a leader of the nations, as a warrior. But do you think about him as a prophet? If you start to think about him as a prophet, you'll see several scriptures that are messianic, period. One of those is Psalm 16, but it, if you look at it at first, it really doesn't look that way. It looks like David's just writing about himself. But there are, there's, how many you got left? Oh, raise your hand again. We're not done yet. There, Bonnie's got one. <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you, they're in Aramaic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
But Peter wrote that day, and remember, he's giving a sermon to the people, to the Jews, to those God-fearing that gathered together for the festival about Jesus, about how the Scriptures, all of the Old Testament, because that's the Bible they have at this point, is, speaks of Jesus. If you remember, Jesus hung around after he was killed, buried, and raised, raised again. He stayed around 40 more days convincing them that he was alive and talking to them about the kingdom of heaven. I want to read you some scriptures from Galatians to start with. Paul is the author of Galatians. It's to the church in Galatia, to several churches. It's written somewhere around the year 53 to 54 A.D. Pentecost happened somewhere around the year 33 to 34. You might read, you know, slight differences in years. But my point here is, Paul writes these letters to these churches 20 years roughly after Pentecost. We know what happened at Pentecost. The Spirit of God came mightily among the apostles, and we've already looked at that, and that included up to at least 120. And as you read, you'll see that the Spirit continues to come on the power on the new believers. You see the birth of the church where it exploded, and you see that lives were changed. They didn't think of things of their own anymore. They didn't even think of their life of being their own. They gathered together in community for one another, and they told others about the hope that they had in Jesus Christ. So here are some words that Paul writes to Galatians. And I read these a few weeks ago, some of these. And I told you to think about it. How would you feel if the person who helped lead you and mentor you, you know, lead you to salvation and mentor you in, in discipleship and stuff, what if he came to you later and read these wor- said these words to you, wrote them or said them? Galatians 3 verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of law? Because another gospel had crept in. A gospel that said that you have to work for salvation. And salvation is 100% based on grace. It is a gift of God. Nothing that you can do, have done, will do, will ever warrant that gift that is given to you. It's given to you because the giver wants to give it. But you need to receive it. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? And I don't know about you, but my grandma said, you don't call nobody a fool. So that's bad. But he's writing there, how foolish they are. Are you so foolish after starting in the Spirit, are you now finishing in the flesh? And I want to stress here again, how many times do we foolishly do that? That we rely on our own power instead of God's power that lives inside of us. And that's why I've tried to stress what happened in the early church. The gift that we have been given of Him, the Holy Spirit, coming to live with us and His purpose in our lives, which has not changed. Verse 4, have you suffered so much for nothing? If, if it really is, was for nothing... Verse 5, does God lavish His Spirit on you and work miracles among you because you practice the law or because you hear and believe? So 20 years later, God is still pouring out His Spirit. There are still miracles happening in the church. There is still growth in the church. 20 years later, the same thing that happened at Pentecost is still happening. So shouldn't it be happening today? If you drop down to verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And if you remember the verses we read last week, Jesus told his disciples to wait till they were clothed with power from on high. That dynamite power, that explosive power that is the Spirit of God that can raise people from the dead, that can create out of nothing that can change you from an ain't into a saint, is how I like to say it. Because you are a new creation in Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, free, male nor female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Wow. Think about that. You are a child of God. Nothing can harm you. Nothing can separate you from Him. And you have at your disposal God's power. Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So also when we were children, we were enslaved under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive our adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And I told you that's the same prayer language that Jesus Himself cried out to the Father. That you, because the Spirit lives in you, are a child of God, and you can cry out to your Father just as Jesus did. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and since you are a son, you are an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather you are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to these weak and worthless principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them over again? You try to fight your own battles and see where it gets you. <laughs> it is by God's grace that we have an atmosphere that we can breathe every single day. This smoke <laughs> is nothing compared to the smoke that you will face for all eternity for not knowing Jesus Christ. And the wages of our sin is death. God had every right to completely destroy us and not give us this hope. But instead, He gave His Son to die for us so that we could live for Him. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it you keep turning back to those weak and worthless principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Because you will serve one master or the other. And then in Galatians chapter 5, Paul writes, verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are those fruits in your life? Are you a fruit tree? Are you bearing fruit? And is this the fruit that you're bearing? Verse 25, Since we live by the Spirit, let us walk in step with the Spirit. These words are written 20 years later, after the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is still living powerfully in the church. But guess what? Sometimes we walk away from the Spirit rather than walking in step with the Spirit. Thank goodness the Spirit of God is still there. He's faithful. He's not going to leave you. But it's up to you whether you walk in step with the Spirit or not. And that's why I've tried to stress so much that the Spirit, He, lives in you. That Jesus said, you will see me when I send the Spirit. And Jesus said that Him and the Father were one. And all because of these things, you know God in a way that the Old Testament saints like David, the prophet David, never knew. He might have foreseen this, but he didn't get to experience it. You are a child of God, and God's Spirit lives inside of you and will live in you for all eternity. Consequently, consequently when, the church, when the Spirit came, the church was born, and it was born in power. And Paul preaches about that same lifestyle that took place back at Pentecost. So we'll go back to Pentecost. And I tried to paint a picture for you of what was going on in the nation of Israel. Because God would come to Jerusalem first, then to Judea, then to Samaria, then to the other, other ends of the earth. All of the promises that He made for the Israelites are still there. And I'll briefly go over this again. But basically for hundreds of years there were no words from any prophet. 
It was as if God had abandoned his children. It was a dark time. We know that there's smoke out there. Some people are being evacuated, everything else. There are places where you can't breathe. But God is still in control. He still loves. And there's an opportunity in some of those times for the church to be a light to the world, whatever that may be. A safe haven because of evacuation. A, a place where the members of the church go out and help clothe and feed people. Whatever it is. And see, Peter looked for that opportunity when the Spirit came upon him. God doesn't abandon his children. He promised the Israelites many things, and he was faithful even though they were basically going through the motions. Think about the religious leaders at that time. They were blind guides leading the blind to destruction, and they had made the laws so cumbersome that no one could obey them. Rome, a foreign kingdom, had captured them. But yet Rome was their security, wasn't it? Rome was who provided for them. And you pay your taxes and your reverence to Caesar, don't you? But what about Jesus who comes on the scene? Before he comes, we do have a voice crying out in the wilderness, saying to repent for the kingdom, not of Rome, not of Israel, but the kingdom of God was at hand. Repent, change your way of thinking so that it changes your heart, changes your behavior, so that you don't have any other gods before him so that you don't covet, so that you thank God and praise Him and worship Him. The heavens opened up and the Spirit of, of the Lord descended upon Jesus. And then He was tempted and He passed those temptations. He was tempted so He could go with you through any temptation that you might see. And He began His public ministry, quoting from the book of Isaiah that He was the Messiah the anointed one, the holy one from God, the one who would save their people from their sins. <clears throat> Jesus began by preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of God was at hand. He taught scripture like no prophet had done before. And he even did mighty miracles by the finger of God, proving that he was who he said he was. Did he say he was a prophet? No. He said that he was God himself in the flesh, come to live with us, and that he would passionately lay down his life for his friends, and that he would rise again, and that he wouldn't leave them or abandon them, but he would go back to heaven to prepare a place for them. And they needed to be expectantly hopeful for the gift God would send them not of eternal life, but the gift of the Spirit to walk through this world with them and then eternal life. If you're longing just for eternal life, you're missing the whole point of living by the power of God now, by living like Jesus in this world today, by making God's plea of reconciliation to mankind through you because you're listening to the Spirit and the power that the Spirit has. And who knows what gifts the Spirit will give you to do that job. Are you seeking God's will? Are you praying that His kingdom comes? Are you satisfied with your daily bread? Are you forgiving debt, your debtors as Jesus forgave you of your sins? A new time of hope comes. Jesus leaves and He says, wait and be prepared. But the disciples are fearful. They're gathered together. They're of one mind and one accord praying for the kingdom of God to come, but also praying for this promise. And then one day, <laughs> this tempest sound comes. It doesn't say wind is with it or anything. It says a sound like a mighty tempest or a hurricane or a tornado. And then they saw what looked like or appeared to be tongues of fire landing on each of them because it was time for the job that Jesus had told them they needed to do as disciples who would deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after Jesus. That they would love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And they would love their neighbor as themselves. And as we read on, you'll see that the church did that. And in chapter 5, we'll see what happens when you lie to the Holy Spirit. That's the one with Ananias and Sapphira, if you're not sure of that. But here's the scene. All of this expectancy 
to the day that the Holy Spirit comes. And last week we looked at what the Holy Spirit told Peter to say, and he prophesied from the uh, prophet of Joel. So we don't even really know who Joel was. We know he's a minor prophet, which doesn't mean that. That means he didn't write that much. He's a prophet that if you look at those minor prophets, most of those minor prophets are all talking about repentance, about turning back to God, because he's warning them and warning them and warning them that they need to fear only Him, that they need to serve only Him. And remember, it's not your job to save. It's God's job through the Holy Spirit. But you get the privilege, the authority, and the power from God to be His witness, which that same word even means martyr. Does Jesus mean that much to you? Is He living through you? Have you been clothed with power from on high? So if we get to Acts chapter 2, I'll lead you up to this part again. Verse 5, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews. If you don't fear God, you don't have the beginning of wisdom. You're not even interested in it. But for, for those that are fearing God, they don't know what happened with Jesus, this Messiah. Maybe they encountered Him, maybe they didn't. They hear all of these rumors. They, they've got eyewitness accounts. Maybe they've seen Lazarus himself, whatever it is. But they don't know the truth yet about Jesus. So they come together for the festival. They were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when this sound rang out, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking his own language. Astounded and amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Now, one of the biggest excuses that we have as Christians is, I'm not prepared, right? I don't have that gift. Someone else will do it. God has given you the authority and the power to do whatever He calls you to do for the kingdom of God. Don't say you can't witness. Don't say you can't teach a Sunday school class. Don't say you don't have the money to give for this need that the Holy Spirit's putting on you. Isn't God the giver of all things and doesn't He give graciously? And He asks for those to give out of a cheerful heart? Don't say you can't. Say, yes, I can. Because I am a child of God. I love a shirt Sherry has where it says that every day that she wakes up because she's a daughter of the Most High that Satan says, oh boy, she's awake now. <laughs> because that's the power that we have. He has no authority in our lives. Death has no power over us. Verse 8, How is it then that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cap Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya and near Cyrene. I didn't ask you to read that. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. The world that fears God is gathered together in one place. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Astounded and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? Verse 13, but others mock them, saying they are drunk on new wine. That shouldn't stop you. You're supposed to, as P Peter tells us later, to give a, an account for the hope that we have, but to do it with gentleness. There will always be those who mock you, who don't want to hear your words, but don't let that silence you. Tell them of the hope you have. And to tell them of the hope you have, we've got to go back to the Old Testament and all the teachings of Jesus. You need to be a holy set-apart people. You need to be holy, righteous, where that they see your good works, and they, even though they mock you and point fingers at you, they can't find condemnation in you. Because every person knows deep down in their heart, in their soul, in their spirit, wherever you want to put it, what's right and what's wrong. When we go walk away from God, that's when we start making everything gray. Verse 14. Then, because Peter has the Spirit upon him, and so do the others, Peter stood up with the eleven. 
He lifted up his voice and addressed the crowd. He didn't have a prepared sermon. He had been studying the Scriptures, the Old Testament too on top of that, right? And he got the gift of prophecy from the Spirit to explain what this Joel, prophet Joel wrote, that I am sure you that the scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders were teaching incorrectly. <clears throat> Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen carefully to my words. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he reads what we read last week. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven and above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our job is to be a witness so that others can be saved. You don't have to know exactly what everything means. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to know Hebrew and Greek or anything else. You have to know Jesus. And if the Holy Spirit lives in you, the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus and will guide you into all truth. But, you know, if you don't know where you're going, first of all, that's a problem, right? But if you know where you're going here for this trip, then there's a map that helps you get there. And that's the Holy Spirit and God's Word. If you're not studying His Word, if you're not praying, if you're not seeking the Spirit because you care about the spreading the gospel message to others, then you're probably not going to see the Spirit work through you. And you might not even have the Spirit of God in you. And then we read, read about these fruits that we should have as proof. And I think back to that verse where they will know you because of your love, not because of your spiritual intellect, not because you carry a Bible, not because you go to church. And they sure won't know you for your hypocrisy as a Christian. They might know you as something different, as a hypocrite. So are you seeking God and His kingdom? He is trying to, through you, He is through you, not trying to restore the kingdom of heaven here on earth until Jesus comes and makes everything right. So the obscure prophet of Joel was the first gift of prophecy that the Holy Spirit gave to Peter. And we looked at that video last week, and hopefully that helped you, that it was a letter written to the children of God, the Israelites, to repent for the day of the Lord was coming when Jesus returned. We know what Jesus did when He was here. We know that Jesus is returning. We know that He said it's better for Him to leave so that He can send the Spirit. So how are you living your life saying all that? Are we telling others and showing them God's love before that day when Jesus returns comes? Sure, us who know Jesus, it will be a great and wonderful day. But for those who don't know Jesus, it will come like a thief in the night and take away everything that they ever put their hope or trust in. Is your hope and trust in Jesus? Peter would let later write this about that coming day in his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Beloved, do not let this one thing escape your notice. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. Remember, Peter thought that the Lord would come and Jesus would return in his lifetime. But yet he writes these scriptures because the Holy Spirit gives them to him. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the work 
the earth and its work will be laid bare, exposed. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? I'll say that one again. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to conduct yourselves in holiness and godliness as you anticipate and even hasten the coming of the day of God when the heavens will be destroyed by fire and the elements will melt in heat, heat because that day will be better for those who know Jesus. But in keeping with God's promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, as you anticipate these things, make every effort to be found at peace, spotless and blameless in His sight. So if you anticipate heaven whatsoever, being with Jesus, then you should anticipate the Holy Spirit and know that the Holy Spirit lives in you and be seeking what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you for your mission to spread the gospel. That should permeate your being. You should not want anyone that you know, enemy or friend, especially family member, to not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because one day they will die, or the Lord might return before then. He might return now. We have no idea. So we have an urgency to live holy lives and to tell others about Jesus Christ. I said before, Joel is so obscure that we don't really know much about him. We know a little bit. <laughs> We know what his name means. Do you know? Do you know what Joel's name means? Yeah. And we know who he's the son of, and we know what, what his father's name means. I, I, it just, to me, it just... You're right. Nobody knows, do they? That's okay. Joel 1.1. One, one. This is the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. I don't know if I'm saying that right or not. Joel, who is he? Well, his name means vision of God. <laughs> wow. And his daddy's name means Jehovah is God. Because see, the Holy Spirit gave Joel this letter, this vision, saying that God is God. God. And because He is God, He is holy. He is just. He is also loving, merciful, and kind. Repent, for the day of the Lord will come, and the earth will be melted away, and your works will be laid bare before God. Repent and live a holy life and tell others about Jesus. You know, something else that's kind of neat is Joel is the second of the minor prophets. That means he comes after the first, for the third. And he comes after the book of Daniel. You know what Daniel's about and all the visions of Daniel. But Hosea is the first minor prophet. What does Hosea say? He says, I love you, 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 you unfaithful harlot. That's what he says. Barry's eyes are like, what? And he says, I'm talking about you, my children, Israel. I love you, I love you, I love you, even though you've been unfaithful. Not just unfaithful, but terribly unfaithful. And I'm going to continue to love you, love you, love you. <coughs> and then we get Joel, who gets a vision from God, that God is God, that he will be, bring about his justice. But until that day comes, He's going to love you and love you and love you and try to draw you near Him if you'll respond to His love. And then after Joel, we've got, uh, I think it's Amos. I've got to find my notes here. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what uh, Joel says also after he says who he is. In verses 2 and 3, it says, Hear this, O elders, He's talking to them uh, just as much if not more because they're supposed to be the one leading their people. And give ear all who dwell in the land. So this is for everybody, not just the elders. Has anything like this ever happened in our days or in the days of our father? And he's talking about uh, this locust problem. Tell it to your children. Let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. Remember, Paul says, remember the things that have been written so that you learn from them. How a mighty angel came and destroyed those in the wilderness. 
Learn from the, your parents' mistakes where they've not been holy and righteous so that you will live holy and righteous and so that you will write the Word of God on your doorposts so that you'll worship Him with all your heart so that you'll teach your children and their children's children and their children's children. And remember those verses about blessings and cursings and how God carries them on from generation to generation. So Amos is the next minor prophet, and he writes this in Amos 7, 7, and 8. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing by a wall, true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. Amos, what do you see? asked the Lord. A plumb line, he replied. Behold, said the Lord, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will no longer spare them. Now, I think most of the men here for sure know what a plumb line is. But if you don't know, it's something that a builder uses to make sure that what he's building is square so that the foundation can be secure. It's a straight line. So God himself is saying he is putting a straight line out there. When John the Baptist came, he said that he was making the path straight, that Jesus would be doing that. Our plumb line is Jesus. He is the one who is righteous. He is the one who died for our sins, and we are clothed with his righteousness if we put our faith and trust in him. And we are to live like him, and we have the power to do so. So taking Peter's own words, if God is the builder and he's building a royal priesthood then what kind of people ought we to be? Are we living a holy life, showing and telling others the way? And we have no excuse because God has poured out His Holy Spirit to build the church, the children of God. Reading on in Acts, chapter 2, starting in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this message. Jesus of Nazareth was a man certified by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He was delivered up by God's set plan and foreknowledge, and you by the hands of, lawless, hands of the lawless put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, releasing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for him to be held in his clutches. So the next words that the Holy Spirit's going to give him of prophecy from the Bible is from David. Acts chapter 22 verses 25 through 28. David says this about him. I saw or I foresaw by the Holy Spirit the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will dwell in hope. Because you will not abandon my soul to hell, nor will you let your Holy One see de decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that we have power on this earth and that we will live eternally. Because Jesus is the first one that was raised from the dead. God would not let him, his body see decay. And because he is the first fruits of that, we can be sure of his resurrection. Now, to give you a little more insight here, that's something that they did not understand whatsoever. That was a new concept to them. David didn't even understand. He wanted to dwell with the Lord, but he never had the foreknowledge that Jesus would come the way he did, that he would be killed, that he would rise again and have victory over the grave. You and I can understand that from Scripture. That's why it started when Jesus was killed, and then we celebrated Easter, and then days later we celebrated Passover. I mean, not Passover, Pentecost, I'm sorry because the Holy Spirit had come upon us. Peter is quoting from Psalm 16 as we read today. And did you know that in Acts chapter 13, when Paul begins his missionary journeys, when he starts out with his uh, reaching to the uttermost end of the earth, that he quotes from Psalm 16 also? He also quotes from Psalm 2, which I read you before, Isaiah 55, and then he quotes from Psalm 16. In Acts 13, here's what Paul writes. Verse 26, Brothers, children of Abraham, and you Gentiles who fear God, same thing there again, but to the Gentiles, 
It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning Him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. And though they found no ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have Him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about Him, they took Him down from the tree and laid Him in a tomb. But God raised Him from the dead, and for many days... He was seen by those who had accompanied him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. And now we proclaim to you the good news, what God promised our forefathers. He has fulfilled for us their children by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. In fact, God raised him from the dead, never to see decay. As he has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So also he says in another Psalms, you are not to let your holy one see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. His body was buried and his fathers, and his, with his fathers and it saw decay. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Now, that does not mean that Jesus' body did not decay any, because I've seen so much stuff on that, that the body starts immediately decaying because it self-digests itself, so to speak. It means that God would not leave His body to decay. He brought Him back to life, and if you put your faith in Jesus, you will have eternal life. But don't miss the point that you're to live by the power of the Holy Spirit now. King David or Prophet David saw all of this and wrote it down by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. The power that came from on high. To live as holy priests. To build this kingdom that God is building with Jesus as the chief cornerstone, and then we lay upon that foundation. Think about that. Who wants to read some Bible verses? Who has? Galatians 5.1. Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, and do not let yourself be burned again by a yoke of slavery. How about Romans 6.7? For one who has died has been set free from sin. Romans 13, 8. Let no death remain outstanding, except the continuing death of love one another, whoever loves another, fulfill the law. Galatians 5, 13. Second Corinthians three seventeen. For the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. John eight thirty two. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. First Peter two sixteen and seventeen. Let us let us keep you free, not using your freedom to cover up for you, but living in the service of God. Honor everyone. Psalm 118.5 Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Isaiah 61.1 The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. John 8, 36. So as the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Romans 6, 18. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Romans 8, 2. For the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin. Romans 8, 21. That the creation itself will be set free. Corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
1 Corinthians 9.19 Romans 6.22 Hebrews 2.14 and 15 Did you know that Jesus is alive? Did you know that he sent the Holy Spirit so that you could live? You have been set free. Now you say, we are free indeed. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 verse 29. Brothers, I can tell you with confidence that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb. In it, tomb is with us this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, to which we are all witnesses. Exalted then to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself writes, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's Psalms 110 verse 1. Then on that day, Jesus will return. The thing is, is are you a sheep or a goat? Are you an enemy or are you a friend of Jesus Christ? And is your life living proof that you love God for all that He has done for you. Because you don't even know love without knowing God, because God is love. Then um, Peter writes in verse 36, Therefore let all Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is the one. I'm going to give you one more nugget to chew on. And I noticed that Polly and Merle didn't say this part. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, up top on this Psalm 16, it says that this is a miktam. Is that even close? There's two ways of spelling it. M-I-C-H-T-A-M and M-I-K-T-A-M. And I, if I do any kind of accent like I should, miktam, he does it. Okay, it says this is a miktam, I'm going with that, of David. What's a miktam? Oh, I, <laughs> I know, you didn't want to pronounce it. But this psalm, it helps to know this psalm, this psalm is a miktam of David. Did you know David's the only one that wrote miktams? <laughs> Did you know that? Okay, I'll go ahead and give you homework. There are five other miktams found in the Psalms. And every one David writes about going from captivity, spiritually, I would probably say of sin, to victory. And spiritually, I'd say again, in Jesus and life in the Spirit. But this song is one of those six then, because there are five others. Psalm 1 said, Blessed is the one, this is the first Psalm, Psalm 1, the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that, way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but, though, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on His law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Psalm 1. The alternative is Psalm 2, which we just saw Paul cite. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in His anger and terrifies them in His wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain, and His name is Jesus. You can take path one and have 
the joy that Jesus promised you, the peace that surpasses all understanding, where you don't have to worry or fear because God is always with you. You can cry out to Him as your Father no matter what you face because you are His child. And nothing can separate you from the love of God that is through Christ Jesus our Lord. Or you can choose path two. And there's a world out there that has chosen path two, and you're called to be the light to the world. We don't know what the word miktam means. It is a mystery. Most of what scholars will tell you is that it's some kind of musical something, but they don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. It's on the top of the psalm, so it's there, but they don't know what it is. In Psalm 16, David wrote that mystery to you. And if you look at the other Psalms, you'll see some of that also. And they're in sequence, just so you'll find them. Because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he prophesied. And he said that Jesus would not see decay. So even though he did not understand resurrection, he had confident hope in it. You and I know that later... Jesus did die. He was buried and He rose again. And He has given you the authority and the power to preach about Him until He returns. And if you die first or that day comes, you will rise again because of your faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that's good news. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You for the Spirit that You have indwelled us with. Lord, help us to not take such a gift lightly, but to realize that we are your children, that we do have the power of God living in us. Help us to be compassionate like Jesus was compassionate, that we can understand that new commandment to love as Jesus has loved, and to understand the importance of this job and the urgency what part we're playing in reconcili reconciliation of God to man. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, your holiness, your mercy, and your grace, that you would pour out your own son's life to save ours. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.